good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the seventh annual Don Mkwanazi Lecture. My name is Bui Belomabe, a proud member of the BMF, serving in the Sanson branch, and tonight I have the great pleasure of being your program director for this prestigious and important event on the BMF calendar. With that said, I would like to officially welcome all esteemed BMF leadership and members. I would like to welcome the Mkwanazi family joining us tonight and all the guests and invitees, you are most welcome and we hope that you will find a home in the BMF in your journey. We gathered here today really to commemorate a life so important not only to the BMF, but to this country as a whole. And that is the life of Dr. Donald, affectionately known as Don Mkwanazi. Now I'm going to share a little bit about, um, you know, this great person that we are here about today. And just to understand why it is that we are commemorating this great life and the great things that he has done for all of us to actually be sitting here and enjoying the benefits of not only you know, this country, but this very organization being the BMF. So he led the BMF during the political transition leading to the release of political prisoners and South Africa's transition to democracy. Dr. Don Mkwanazi is also credited for his role in the lobbying and promulgation of the Black Economic Empowerment Act, as referred to as one of the pioneers of BEE, he also led and established the BMF student chapter in 1991, and it was under his leadership that the BMF also encouraged aspiring managers to join the forum, and it was open, opened up not only to just managers. Without further ado, I would love to invite the BMF KZN chairperson, Ms. Farah Ali, for welcoming remarks. You may unmute. Thank you, program director. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Farah Ali, and in my capacity as the KwaZulu Natal Provincial Chair, on behalf of the BMF and the BMF KZN province, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all on this, the seventh annual Don Mkwanazi Lecture. It gives me immense pleasure to acknowledge the Mkwanazi family, our president, Andile Nomlala, keynote speaker, Professor Bonang Mohale, my fellow BMF board members, the KZN committee members, past presidents, stalwarts of the BMF, our valued BMF members, and our trusted friends of the BMF for your presence this evening. July is an important month for the BMF and a highlight in the calendar of the KZN province as we gather to remember, honor, and celebrate the life and contributions of a Durban legend and a South African icon who is Dr. Don Mkwanazi. Lectures such as these allow us the time to pause, take a moment and reflect on the impactful and significant contributions of the leaders who came before us. Confident and extremely ambitious, two defining characteristics of Dr. Mkwanazi. His greatest ambition can be summed up in just one of his statements, quote, the economic emancipation of my people, unquote. And he was relentless in his commitment, passion and sacrifice in making monumental strides on his journey to achieving this. He set a very high standard for leadership, commitment and sacrifice. Once again, I welcome you all. And I know that you are looking forward to the keynote address as much as I am. So I thank you and I wish you a pleasant evening further. Thank you, Program Director. I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Farah, for that incredible welcome. I am sure everyone is uh, feeling warm, hopefully, and uh, ready for the great program that we have ahead of us tonight. Um, and just moving on in, into the program, I would like to welcome our BMF president, Mr. Andy Lenomlala, to give us a word. Uh, good evening. Uh... Boy Pilo, and, and thanks for, for having me. I must uh, firstly apologize. Uh, I won't uh, put up my video. 
I'm not home. Uh, I I I was here where I am at the registration for the ANC policy conference from 2 p.m. And I had thought that by now we would have been served and unfortunately we're not. So I had to step out and, and come and take the lecture. I'm actually traveling with the deputy president uh, of PMF and uh, she is holding the line at the moment. It's a, there's a lot of people, so I must apologize sincerely. Uh, most importantly, to the Mkwana's family for that, and and then I must <coughs> greet uh, you, Sizwa, uh, firstly, and the rest of the family. I think the Bonuba Bumafika Mkwanazi and the rest of the Mkwana's family uh, and Noma Mkwanazi. Uh, I must greet you, colleagues, and it's been it's unbelievable that it's been seven years uh, now. Uh, it seems like it was yesterday when we when Wabuton uh, departed, I, I remember, I still remember very well his last event at the, at the, at the uh, Emperor's Palace where he attended at PMF gathering. <clears throat> uh, I must greet uh, uh, President uh, Bonang Mohane. I saw President Begisbia uh, in the chat chats and uh, in the list of people that have attended, I must greet all the stalwarts of PMF that I haven't noticed, especially uh, KZ and stalwarts. We know that more often than not, if we had this lecture physical, uh, the KZ and leadership and stalwarts uh, usually come uh, in their numbers. We, it's always a successful event. And therefore we believe that <clears throat> we must uh, thank them and greet them for being here. But for me, <clears throat> I, won't, I won't make a long speech as I've already alluded to the situation I'm currently in. But I, I wouldn't not ask and, and think to myself that uh, what is the difference between the current period that our country is in and the 1985 to 1990 uh, period that uh, Bradon himself categorized as watershed uh, moment. What is the difference today with the picture and the situation that we find ourselves in as a black populace in particular? And I can't, uh, uh, for the life of me, not think what would Bradon would have said in these moments? What would uh, Bradon's leadership would have been in these uh, moments? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself that uh, what is it that uh, his organization that is led by me today is doing and what is his organization uh, that is led by me is, 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 is doing in, this, in, the, in these days. Uh, and I'm, I'm imagining that they would have, as the giants that they have been, by now, they would have had numerous uh, conversations with, with the leadership of ANC. They would have numerous documents that would have been flooding the public and, and giving perspective of what the country should be. And, and it's unfortunate that, uh, to be quite honest, as we speak, and, and the BMF does uh, echo its voices on many of these things, but it looks like, unfortunately, we are now talking to stones and, and we're talking to people that are not prepared to be persuaded uh, on any of their positions. I can't imagine for the life of me that in our days today, South Africa uh, as a government of, of, of the people, by the people as it's supposed to be, can't provide any of the most important basic needs of human uh, beings. We can't provide education to our people. We can't provide health to our people. We can't provide security to our people. And most importantly, we can't provide energy to our people soon. Uh, in fact, in most places already, we can not provide basic necessities such as water and, sanita and sanitation. 
and and we are a government that is leaping from one crisis to the other and we are led <clears throat> by people that have proven beyond reasonable doubt that their main interest is to serve their pockets first and everything else shall follow and i and i can think of myself as a as a black middle class and whatever category of the middle class that i am is that what is it that those few of us which is in in most cases the white population the political elite and the black middle class uh, who are probably the only people that could say the democracy means something to them uh, in terms of the benefits and the dividends that we have derived since our democracy and i'm asking myself as black professionals what are we doing beyond the fact that we we trade our skills we 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 develop the thinking and the industry that is currently functioning in our country but what are we doing uh, in terms of getting access to the leadership levers of our country at the political level because there's no one that can deny that uh, the level of of leadership that we have especially in the political realms is at the worst ever in the history of african national congress one would not imagine and one would not associate a or tambo character and a, a persona of or tambo uh, and they wouldn't associate a persona of babu nelson mandela a persona of all the stalwarts of anc the luminaries that had gone out throughout the world the albert lutulis and and the rest one cannot figure out how did their organization deteriorate to the levels that is at now you would not imagine that the anc leaders of the past are the people that associated and put character of south africa as a nation in the global stage but when you see anc today i'm um, i'm in an anc uh, place as we speak and you could see that the people that take decisions about our country and, and one mustn't judge a book by its cover but you could almost tell that we are really in the dogs uh, one cannot imagine how the 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 anc of of our liberators and the anc of government today has turned out to be what it is but can we afford as the citizen of south africa can we afford to continue languishing in the situation that we are in and shifting blame to only the leadership at the political level i know that the responsibility is much heavier on them because they managing the country but what are we doing as black professionals in trying to agitate and in trying to find ourselves in the spaces of the national political leadership sphere because no matter what we can say and do things are falling apart our the, the country everybody can agree and i don't want to go into each aspects but i wouldn't stop not saying this uh, before i i stand down boy pino that in our conversations with 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 the president even via bpc or even myself directly with him is that we we can't phantom what is this thing of doing everything necessary to bulldoze renewable energy in our country all as experts from around the globe even with the experience of the advanced economies that have had a much more longer history than us in implementing renewable energy now can confirm that they can't rely on it as a base load and i know that <clears throat> now we are told that we will build renewable energies of 15 10000 megawatts or 15000 megawatts and we will have battery storage of 5000 megawatts but but does people tell you that 
around the world today, as we speak, there's only 17,000 of battery storage that has been put uh, and next to renewables, which is where the solar or wind. Now, if South Africa says in 24 months or in 12 months, uh, 18 months, whatever the period is, which is less than two years, <clears throat> they will be able to install a battery power of 5,000, whilst China has 3,000, whilst the US has 4,000 install installed a uh, battery power. Now, where would that 5,000 uh, uh, battery power come from? Who, who, as we speak now, is manufacturing batteries that South Africa can procure for 5,000? That are 5,000 megawatts uh, capacity when the whole world has only 17,000 installed a uh, battery power. Now, the second thing is, the other day we had a meeting uh, with the with the CEO of uh, Spanish Steelwater, Neil Foreman. Foreman said to us that he, as Steelwater, is uh, mining PGMs, which is the base metals that are linked into the renewable sector, which becomes ingredients in the battery power, palladium and palladium, and all of those things. Now we hear a pronouncements being made that we mustn't uh, focus on localization. And yet, as a country, we had abandoned already. At some point, there was a huge talk around beneficiation, beneficiating our minerals and, and processing them for a little bit longer, just to create jobs, build the economy. But today we have the most needed minerals uh, in the renewable energy sector. And we are arguing amongst ourselves that the desperate situation that we're in warrants us to take our minerals, export them as raw as they are to China and wherever else in Europe. And then we allow them, whilst we don't have jobs here, in their factories to build and create these batteries and sell them to us as triple and four times the price that we would have, that it would have costed us to build them in South Africa. For the life of me, I can't understand where and when are we gonna be able to create these jobs when even at the critical level and people are using agency, how long would it take? There's a company, Metia, here in South Africa that produces batteries for Telsa. Why wouldn't they be given and the procurement and be given clear guidelines of the empowerment. The other thing is that the whole renewable energy sector is new, but government also seems to now want to abandon the empowerment requirements of that sector. We are building a new industry and one in 2050 would be putting uh, all sorts of manner of regulations to try and bring empowerment in that industry. And yet we were here when it was built. We were here when it was growing. We were here when it was created, but no one cares to say black people must be at the center of the renewable. And I would say this uh, family and everybody has seen the statement of PMF We are very clear that we welcome renewable energy as part of our energy mix, right? But we can't rely, even if you install 100,000 megawatts of renewable, when the sun is not shining, there won't be electricity. And it's a lie that you would wake up tomorrow and having 5,000. South Africa can't install 5,000 batteries in a space of 24 months. It's not, it's not possible. It's not possible from the point of manufacturing it and from the point of them being cost effective to our country. The battery technology is still very expensive at the moment. Now, all of these things, we are here. Our eyes are wide open. Our, our cousins, our sisters are eating grass. And all of us, I was, I was so shocked and I realized how far removed even myself as a person to the realities of our country. I go home to my mother's house and there was no water and there was no electricity for the whole weekend. 
And guess what? I then decide, you know what? I'm gonna install solar and battery, and I'm gonna install uh, uh, the uh, the tanks and the pump. But the reality is that then it becomes hair and who? Because I don't suffer from, from load shedding because my house is off the grid and all of those things. But the rest of our people, including our own family members, are, are living in the doldrums because we, the privileged few that went to school as professionals, we prefer to serve ourselves via our corporate work, which is necessary, by the way, to keep our heads above the water. But what do we do to challenge and take over the political power? Because without us administering the country, then the country is going to be in the dogs. And in leadership, there's no vacuum. If you are not there leading, somebody else will take it with whatever interests and capabilities, by the way. So the functioning of our state, the planning to date, forget about what happened five years ago, 10 years ago, the current trajectory that we're in is not convincing for the future of our country. Before you know it, remember today, if you want proper education, you have to pay for it privately. If you want proper health care, you have to pay for it privately. Now, the, the pronouncement that the president made on energy as an emergency matter says clearly that we are also, if you can't afford to have electricity, then you won't have electricity. Only the people that can pay privately. The whole liberalization of the energy sector means that somebody who has the money is going to power their own private personal business and their own family and their own households alone. You can't say to the people in the country that they must invest in, in solar. Whereas you know that, first of all, the whole roof of an RTP house is one solar panel size. But then you say to me that you had already spent my money to install solar. You say, I must also have the opportunity to earn more and I must sell it to, to ESCOM. What was I going to do with my access uh, uh, electricity? I'm not doing anything with it now. Why can't I donate it to government? Now, it means that if you have a square meterage roof of 1,000 square meters, you would have enough money. You could invest already. If you have a 1,000 square meterage roof, it means you have enough money you afford in this country. And if you afford, then you can even earn some extra cash because ESCOM will fund you by buying electricity from you. What type of a country is that? Where are we going? And we are all here as professionals and we can't shift the blame to the comrades. ANC, I said it many years ago on TV that it's in the dogs because I walked into Lutuli House and I had a meeting with Uma Mujesi and she candidly and kindly and nicely explained the situation, how bad our leadership is. Now, if we're gonna cry about that, it means tomorrow we will be in Zimbabwe and we'll be like typically, because I know friends now who are already immigrating, black people who are already taking opportunities in Canada, Dubai and everywhere else in the world. In the BMF where the colleague that has never lived in South Africa for the last 12 years. Now I'm saying that we have a choice whether we stand and fight and take over the power the political power and run our country the best way we know how, or we perish with the situation that we are currently in. And thank you, Baipilo, and, and thanks for having me, colleagues. Thank you, President Andile, for those thought provoking remarks. I'm actually reminded of a quote from one African leader that basically says Our children may learn about the heroes of the past but our task is to make ourselves architects of the future. And I would like you to hold on to that thought as we go on into tonight's program and the address, because I believe that's exactly what we are doing. But at the end of it, how are we actually becoming architects of the future to ensure that we are building a South Africa, a country that our children can one day be proud of and be proud of us for making that impact? With that said, ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to introduce tonight's keynote address. 
To me, he certainly is like a father because of the way that he just does things. You know, he leads from the heart with much humility and most importantly, with impact. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Ndate Bonang Mohale. A little bit more about him and just some of the incredible work that he's done. He is the president of Business Unity South Africa. He is also the chancellor of the University of the Free State. He is a professor of practice in the Johannesburg Business School. He's also the chairman of the Bidvest Group, SBB Services, among others. He's also a member of the community of chairpersons of the World Economic Forum. And last and certainly not least, he is an author of Best Selling and one of my favorite books, Lift As You Rise and Behold the Turtle. With that, I would like to welcome our keynote address for tonight, Professor Onang Mohal. Wow, with an introduction like that, I feel like um, taking a vow. Siswami, Mebui Pelo, Haki Lebuese Haitidiak. Speaking after my president, Utatu Andile, Nomlala Uno Bula, Man Dibule Lemogus Tobileo, Nogazian the CEO, to the Mkwanazi family for the singular honor of having this conversation with you in the presence of dignified greatness from the black pool of excellence. The rest of my BMF family, thank you so much for choosing to be here this evening at this time in this country, when so many of us dare to hope that joy and peace will prevail. You see, Ubradon Nkwanaz Undong has taught us many things. Today, I just want to focus on the humanity he taught us, how he made us to be truly human. And I will choose my words carefully from the centerpiece of the bottom of my heart. Undonga, through his tireless efforts and struggle to transform this country and make it broadly reflective of its demographics. Taught us that power reveals character. That we as the BMF and business broadly, we have a huge role to play, especially now that business is trusted twice as much as government is. He says, imagine for a moment when business can say, if it is to be, then it's up to me. Because after listening to my president, Utatu Andile Nomlala, that we are in a spot of bother. It is very clear that this ANC-led government is incapable of self-correction. Therefore, if we are going to make South Africa work, business will make South Africa work because you and I have decided that we are going to make South Africa work. We are not South Africa's second chance. We are South Africa's last chance because if we mess it up this time, we will also be another failed African country. Undonga says, imagine when we can use the, fa the power, the force, the impetus of business to represent to those without a voice, releasing better humans, deepening profound understanding. When we help the 60.1 million South Africans to graduate from being humankind to kind humans, where business is seen not only as taking, but regularly giving. Where we can demonstrate beyond any shadow of doubt a deeply caring for each other and one another and meaningfully connected 
especially as black people, because the 370 years of colonialism, 98 years of separate development, 48 years of apartheid, institutionalized apartheid, has wreaked havoc with our minds. Today, foreign converses pour from our lips, borrowed robes hang from our necks. Imagine if we could unleash the uniting bond of peace, because there is no peace amongst black people. There is no peace among senior black executives. To land at a place where we can say we are incredibly constructive citizens, that we ourselves are catalysts of change, that we need to be more mindful of the outsized and oversized impact that we each have in our respective roles as leaders. If we open up space for learning, I'm talking about listening and learning, especially for the poor to participate in the economy because we're beginning to hold the world records for all the wrong reasons. Whilst we are leaders, imagine if we can say we are accessible and friendly rather than aloof and arrogant, where we don't miss the moment, 28 years into democracy to say we are still challenged, we still have a lot of work to do. That we are open to challenge even on those bone deep beliefs of ours. Because leadership is about exactly that, to say everything that I've believed in for all my life, I'm going to put it out in the open so that it is adequately challenged by younger, cleverer, more educated, and much more hardworking leaders of today, not of tomorrow. Helping as business to solve some of the intractable challenges of the country and the most vulnerable to fulfill their basic needs, not even to reach their fullest potential just to have water, a stable, reliable and predictable energy supply because energy is the fourth means of production when land is the primary means of production. Where we can say as business that it is possible to have speed and governance and accountability concurrently, simultaneously, and in parallel. Because our leaders have demonstrated that when we're in a hurry to procure, that's when they eat, that's when they steal, that's when they open themselves up to bribery, stealing and cheating. That's how state capture to root our job, yours and mine, is to make sure that we root out and defeat the state capture. Where as black people, we can say we have unity in purpose, not just to bring about nation building and social cohesion, but because we are our sister's keepers. Where we complement and augment rather than ourselves being center of attention. Where fidelity to the law is sacrosanct. Where we help to preserve ancient wisdom and natural curiosity. Imagine what that world that was reimagined repurposed by Ndonga, that leadership is a privilege to better the lives of others, not an opportunity to enrich itself. That we as members of the BMF must continue to be bastions of leadership, of governance and consistency. That we need to bring about a new culture of leadership by creating holding spaces where you feel safe in my presence because you know I've got your back. That there is no prosperity for any of us if none of us are also okay. That there is no prosperity for all of us 
if we are only concerned about me, myself, I. In exactly the same way that ego is the enemy of leadership. The same way that panic is the enemy of progress. How do we discern as black people that even those that are around us, but are not with us, feel needed and wanted and feel free to speak their mind? Because you see, the pandemic has taught us many things. And one of the things we need to really learn is to how to become truly human in this that we have learned. Let me end by referring to what the president said as some of the challenges that are confronting us. And I'm glad that the president having consulted with us, including the BMF and the BBC, came up really with just five initiatives to try and help stop load shedding fast. And he said in his own words that these initiatives are aimed at improving the performance of ESCOM's existing fleet of power stations. I say that to agree with my president. Secondly, that these are meant to accelerate the procurement of new generation capacity. Thirdly, that these measures are designed to increase private investment in generation capacity. The penultimate one, he says, directed to fundamentally transform the electricity sector and positioning it for future sustainability. Imagine when he ends to say, this is meant to enable businesses and individuals to invest in rooftop solar. My president has spoken about that and I don't want to address it to death. Let me end by saying one of the things we learned from the pandemic and Donga would have approved is that when fisher women can't go out to sea, they repair their nets. 28 years into democracy, what are we doing to repair our nets at a personal level, at an organizational level, but also to reclaim our streets from common criminals? The pandemic has taught us that when a child is not embraced by his village, he will bend it down in order to feel its warmth. Because sons learn by looking at the back of the head of their fathers. It's been an absolute privilege just to paint a picture, a potpourri, a continuum of some of the words that Ndonga himself would have eloquently used. Wow. Thank you so much, Ndate Bonang. You know, with those words, you are invoking so much thought, so much appreciation, and most importantly, challenging us tonight to think about the role that we are playing within our spaces as individuals, and most importantly, together, what is it that we are doing to look out for our brother, for our sister next to us as we go forth and achieve and accomplish the things that we want to accomplish in this time, in this age? Because I think with all the issues and the challenges we are facing today, that is just a true indication that alone we can't go far but together we can go so much further. I really appreciate you tonight and appreciate the words that you have shared as I believe our guests tonight do. And with that, I would like to read one of the, the quotes that came out from the reflections from your book. And you, know, you talk about leadership and you say that a leader does not set out to be a leader but becomes one by the quality of his or her actions and the integrity of her or his intent. And I think for me, this sums up very nicely exactly what it is we need to do as leaders and how we need to consider 
our work, our impact, and how we carry ourselves, the decisions we make in our day to day, in thinking about how we are contributing to making this country one that we will be proud of, and secondly, that our future generations will be proud to call home. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce and invite one of the family members from the Mkwanazi family, and that is Usizwe Mkwanazi, who's going to give us a word as a representative of the Mkwanazi family. Usizwe, you may unmute. unmute. Thank you, Program Director, my sister, Boy uh, Belo Mabu. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, special greeting to Professor Bonang Mohale. Good evening to the President of the Black Management Forum, Mr. Andile Nomlala, Deputy President, SA2, Max Onywa, KZN Chairperson, Farah Eli, and your leadership team, all former presidents and deputy presidents present this evening the Mkwanazi family and the friends of the Mkwanazi family. Ladies and gentlemen, the BMF has assured us that this was the last virtual lecture. We hope to see all of you in Durban in 2023. What a, a powerful message from your side. I really don't have words to describe what you shared with us uh, this evening. But let me try. Inspirational, powerful, genuine, heartfelt, and truly outstanding. Siabonga Gakulu and Dade Mohale. Let me take you back to the 4th of July, 2016, two days after Undonga passed away. You were on John Robbie's breakfast show on Radio 702. And you spoke so well about Don Mkwanaz's work in the BMF during the 1980s into the 90s. Thank you so much for sharing Donga's work with the people of Gauteng in that morning uh, of Gauteng that morning. You were also there in the 1980s. You are truly a stalwart of the Black Management Forum. Who is Ndade Bonang Mohale? You are an open book. That is how I choose to describe you. You have worked and led many companies such as Novartis, Otis, Sunlam, Shell, BMF, BLSA, just to mention a few. You are also an author of two very successful books that have been mentioned, Lift As Your Eyes, Behold the Turtle. You are outspoken, energetic, caring, gifted, kind, and loving. You are also a successful businessman. Unobuntu, Mr. Mohale and Unotando. You lead by, by example and you are a leader. You are courageous, ethical, and a servant leader. The, re the reason I've referred to you as an open book, if you watch television, listen to the news, listen to radio, listen to some podcasts, read some newspapers and have read his books, you know that he's not afraid to express his views on everything, ESCOM, load shedding, poor education, rampant corruption, unemployment, lack of transformation. You are also a great family man, a loving husband, and a father to two daughters, and you are a mentor to many. I just want to quote something from a lady, Ukolosa Matigizela, which reads, Bonang Mohale is an amazing transformational leader who leads by example, in his over 30 years career, he has consistent, he consistently demonstrated integrity, humility, compassion, and huge passion for diversity and transformation by always ensuring that in each leadership role he occupies, he deliberately made room for females, the previously disadvantaged in particularly the underrepresented black females to thrive and excel through leadership development. He has championed many transformational transformation initiatives in his role at the BMF, BUSA, and many other organizations he's been involved in. He's also the best-selling author of two very poignant books, Lift As Your Eyes and Behold the Turtle, of which both books are a testament to the incredible leader he is. Most importantly, he's a devoted husband, father, 
with a passion for his family. Then the other one is from a young man, Ngobani Mzizi. Selfless leadership is synonymous with Babbonang. The mantle of empowering others is one that he not only thoroughly understands, but it's a virtue that he lives by daily. His obsession with humanity and its development, as well as his consistent drive for excellence is what sets him apart. It is safe, it is a safe conclusion to make that his absence would adversely contribute to an intellectually and morally compromised society. As such, we have a responsibility to emulate that which he stands for to ensure that hope never dies. He stands for truth, justice, equality, honesty, people development, and Ubuntu to mention but a few. We are thankful for your grandmother's teaching where she taught that we are successful if the first third of one's life should be devoted to learning, the middle third should be devoted to earning, and now you are living the last third, which is sharing. I, like many who have experienced you, am better because of your selfless pouring into my life. True to your motto, I have lifted with your rising. I am better, we are better. Modimo lebadimo baho sololo fasi. While all human beings are not perfect, looking for, Im, Im, for imperfection in President Mohale is unthinkable. That was President Andile Nomlala. I have not read your second book, but I've read your first one, and you dedicated a chapter to Donald Dawood Dibongani Mkwanazi. Thank you for writing and sharing about Ndonga's work and contribution. I know that, that Ndonga appreciates the gesture, and as a family, we are truly grateful. If you have not read these books, please buy them and read them, and we can maybe convince Professor Bonang Mohale to sign them for us. I just want to imagine briefly what Undonga would be saying right now about you, uh, Professor Mohale. He would be saying that it is great that you've written these books and sharing all your experiences and influencing many other people. And I guess my father's biggest regret was probably not, not writing his book on his experiences. And he spoke about it to us a few times and he had a title of the book, which was Corporate Gorilla. And I would imagine he would have shared about being turned down as a postgraduate student at WITS and his days at the BMF, his career and his journey of self-employment. And he would also talk about the failures and the successes of the democratic uh, government. And we always wonder what his views would be today on load shedding, high unemployment, high crime rate, especially the tavern shootings, the July looting last year, and what his views would be on the current ANC and government leadership. He clearly articulated his views and was happy to share and engage and happily to agree to disagree. He was forward looking. He believed strongly in education and entrepreneurship. His favorite line was economic freedom plus political freedom equals total liberation. Mr. Mohale, in one of your books, you mentioned if your neighbor is hungry, you cannot sleep peacefully. I suspect that would also resonate with him. To the BMF and President Nomlala, again, thank you for always stopping and pausing in July to celebrate Ndonga's work and contribution in the form of a lecture where we get to listen and hear Great speakers share Ndonga's dreams, vision, successes, and failures. You have loved him and never stopped celebrating him since he stepped down as the president way back in 1991. Sia Bonga once again. Thanks for your leadership, uh, Mr. Nomlala, and your work. You never shy away from criticizing the ruling party, the government, and corporates when they fail to transform. You openly express your views on transformation, empowerment, and you've expressed your views quite strongly this evening on the power issues that you face as a country. Keep on fighting, one day is one day. Without the BMF and your vision, I wonder where we would be. Keep on fighting for total liberation and holding the political leaders accountable. Not an easy job, but keep on speaking truth to power. As I conclude, Program Director, 
Thank you for a job well done. Thank you for running the program so smoothly this evening. Thank you very much. And to the BMF, thank you for another successful Donim Konazi Memorial Lecture. To each and every one of you for attending and spending your precious time with us this evening. Thank you so much. And to the organizing committee of the BMF, uh, Kulu, Phil, and everyone that made sure that tonight was a success and took place. Thank you very much. To the KZN BMF chairperson, Farah Ali, thank you for hosting us. And we're looking forward to your hospitality in Durban next year. Ntate Mohale, Kiale Bucha, thank you. We are grateful for a powerful lecture and sharing so much about our father, husband, and friend. From your second book on the very last page, we know that you got married at a young age of 17 and you say the following in your book. If, you had, if I had to live it all over again, I think the only major change I would, I would make, I would marry Susan even earlier. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Sizwe. A big virtual round of applause. <laughs> um, that, that was beautiful, that was so inspiring and um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely moving. Thank you for, for those words and thank you for, for those really powerful reminders for us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of the seventh annual Donam Kwanazi lecture, I would like to leave you with this powerful quote from Ndade Don himself. And it says, we are black first before we are managers. And reading this to me, it means who we are matters, our history, our experiences, and everything that we go through, everything that we experience and think about, because that's exactly what we bring when we show up in all these various spaces as leaders, as managers. So let us never forget that and forget our history and forget who we are. And that's something like tonight actually gives us that opportunity to tap into that and to remind ourselves exactly of who we are, the power that we have as a people, the influence, the impact that we can continue to have even on future generations and in building this country. With that said, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you so much for being here. We understand that we all have incredible things that we are doing in all our lives, but for us to take this moment tonight to come together to commemorate this incredible time, this incredible life, means that we truly are leaders who should be taking you know, the baton forward from the greats such as Ntate Don Mkwanazi. Thank you to the organizers as well, the Black Management Forum. Thank you for the work that you do. We are here today standing in these you know, opportunities, standing in this time as beneficiaries of the great work that is happening in this place and furthermore in this country. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I sure hope that you will have a great and safe night. Thank you. <laughs>